So yeah, Hannah and I here to deliver a paper on the Leeds Flood Alleviation Scheme, something we've both been involved with for quite some time now. My responsibility, if you heard, is design, and Hannah has the job of coordinating the inputs from multiple specialists in the environmental and planning field. Oops. Yeah. So, why is this scheme relevant to this forum, particularly today? Um, we're going to deliver a case study which shows how multiple benefits can be delivered through a partnership approach on what is a very fast-paced project. We'll look at some of the nature-based solutions that we're going to deliver as part of the scheme. We'll show some of the carbon work that we've done assessing our scheme and also assessing benefits, something that perhaps can be used in a business case in the future. And we'll show some examples of the work that we've done in the environmental side. So Leeds and flood risk is a really good barometer of climate change. In the period for 100 years, from 1900 onwards, there's one recorded event of flooding, whereas in the last 20 years we've now had seven, including the one that happened a couple of Sundays ago. Um, those have all been what we could call a near miss, and a near miss in that context is the river running full and sort of vulnerable locations just starting to flood. One of those vulnerable lay locations is the Wharfdale line, which is an important commuter line that runs into the city. The tracks were lowered back in the 90s to get electrification under what's a listed bridge, and that's now a low spot that attracts surface water flooding. It's vulnerable to seepage through the ground, and obviously from river flooding when the river gets high enough as well. Boxing Day 2015, Leeds had the big event, Storm of Eva. Um, it had escaped the ones that happened in 2007 in, in Sheffield and Hull, but um, yeah, that was the one that really made a difference. Hydraulic modelling has categorised that as a 1 in 200 year return event. It caused widespread flooding, businesses, properties and infrastructure. Fortunately, I say it happened on a bank holiday. If it had happened on a normal working day when there are a lot more people in Leeds, it could have been much more catastrophic. There was no loss of life, fortunately, but that could have been different. <coughs> so what happened? Um, in 2015, we were, as we've heard, working in JV with Bam Nuttall, delivering phase one of the scheme, which is walls to give a one in 100 year standard of protection downstream of the station. Um, it actually caused us lots of problems on site. All our copper dams flooded, and a section of embankment between the river and the canal was washed away. And fortunately, we were able to do some emergency repairs on that because if, if the river had drained down, we could have lost all of the, the river walls in the city, which are sort of propped by the, the high water levels with the weirs that are there. Um, it became clear that a much wider area of need, Leeds needed protection. Um, our scheme obviously only covered half of the city at that time. And the political direction that came down to the team from on high, sort of MP level, was that Boxing Day can't be allowed to happen again because of the damages that would cause. So following a tender process, BMM were re-appointed to carry out a specimen design, prepare a business case and obtain a planning permission. Um, project board was set up with Leeds City Council as the promoter, but we also <coughs> had the Environment Agency, Network Rail, Yorkshire Water, Bradford Council, all engaged as project partners. We worked together to produce an outlay and business case, and that used a two-project approach. So the top part of that flow chart was the natural flood management um, schemes that we've implementing. That doesn't stop the need for a civil project, which is the lower side. Um, so that needed a full environmental impact assessment and then a detailed design and build contract. And those two strands together uh, provide an increase in protection to the whole of the city against fluvial flooding for a one in 200 year event. Those are some of the metrics that were produced for the business case. Um, one interesting one is that the number of homes protected is relatively small compared to the size of the scheme. Um, fortunately, it's a local authority promoted scheme. If it had been an environment agency one, it probably wouldn't have proceeded, or it wouldn't have proceeded, because the benefits are largely calculated on domestic properties, and we would never have generated the, the money we needed to, to proceed. So the business case took into account things like growth and job creation and protection of transport infrastructure. Um, and with that, we were able to generate a scheme value of 450 million against a cost of 110. 
the EA helped us steer that through DEFRA and then we eventually in 2019 got a sign off from the Treasury and an instruction to proceed. Looking at a little bit more detail at some of the NFM measures, thank you Hannah, um, there's a catchment area of some 700 square kilometres upstream of Leeds, huge area, so we looked at a whole range of techniques from soil and land management, uh, lots of woodland creation, uh, leaky dams to hold back water in, in small water courses, really meandering, that sort of thing. Um, we undertook hydraulic modelling to assess the benefits of each of those and the ones that came out on top are soil and land management and the woodland creation. Soil and land management is all about working with farmers, so <coughs> looking at areas of overgrazing and overstocking, whether, which compacts the topsoil. We're looking at um, ploughing different ways on steep slopes, such that water is held back rather than running into watercourses. <coughs> and we're also looking at re-aerating soils that have been overcompacted in the past. There's a sum of five million pounds allocated uh, in the business case to this, this NFM work. Um, that's intended as seed funding. The intention is that we mobilize lots of volunteer input, lots of small partner groups to deliver a lot of small schemes. Um, it's also helping to facilitate schemes that partners such as the White Rose Forest are developing but perhaps couldn't proceed under their own resources. <coughs> One interesting fact is that we looked at um, wider scale um, flood storage schemes up in the catchment. What we found is if they are optimised to give benefits to leads, they actually cause local increases in flood risk, so we wouldn't get an FRA through to make those happen. So the point of the NFM measures isn't to reduce or remove the need for, for civil interventions, but it does give us resilience against anticipated climate change in the future. One of the things we did as this is part of the scheme was develop an app which manages a huge amount of information. Um, we've got a lot of small projects across a very large area, so keeping track of all that information was fairly crucial. It combines the output of the hydraulic modelling on a geographic basis and it also brings in databases for utilities and environmental designations. Um, it allows sites to be prioritised and then the EA took that list and started the process of talking to landowners and developing them into real schemes. Uh, it also pre-populates a pro forma of the pre-construction information, so we've, we've got an efficient way of moving from a, a concept into a, a small-scale site delivery. We're two years into a six-year programme of this work. So far we've delivered 100 hectares of soil aeration and facilitated installation of about 300,000 trees. So it's a big start, but there's quite a long way to go on that process to hit the two million target that we've got for the end. So as Pete has already said, although there were numerous benefits with this NFM only approach, we unfortunately couldn't do it on its own. So firstly, the business case didn't stack up for an NFM only scheme. To fund the NFM scheme, it needed to be part of a much bigger scheme, which protected homes, businesses and infrastructure to make it possible. And secondly, flooding was an immediate problem. People were worried about another Boxing Day flood like the one we mentioned at the start. Therefore, there was a lot of political pressure to get this off the ground um, and make sure we stop this happening again. Therefore, a civil scheme was also needed. Um, and Pete's going to discuss that in a bit more detail next. Um, however, when we then went to take this civil scheme to the plans panel, which would grant a planning permission, um, the climate emergency was actually announced a few weeks before. We got a lot of questions of, so what about carbon emissions? How does this scheme fit in with the wider climate agenda? So one way we thought this could be justified was by showing how the carbon emissions <coughs> associated with building the scheme compared to the carbon emissions associated with a flood event. So we already knew what the carbon impact of our flood scheme was, but we didn't know what the carbon emissions associated with flood damage repairs were. So, for example, we wanted to know what carbon emissions are associated with cleaning up roads and railway lines of debris? What is the carbon impact of moving people from the railway line to buses or to cars? If someone's home is flooded and you need to replace all the carpets, what, what is the cost of that from a carbon perspective? However, we couldn't actually find the answer to these questions because there's very limited existing research in this area. Um, so as mentioned earlier, what's one of the like, best ways to deal with that? We engage with university students. 
So we partnered with the University of Edinburgh in 2019 to explore what the carbon emissions associated with flood damage repair were. So we worked with three master's students, one in residential, two in commercial, and three in transport. These students undertook interviews and analysed data around the 2015 flood to work out exactly what the carbon emissions associated with it were. Some of those interviews were actually with Network Rail, um, and we were able to provide them data that they may not have actually been able to get access to without our project support. We then used this to compare to the carbon emissions associated with building our scheme to see what the differences were. These are the results then. So we found, somewhat surprisingly actually, that there were 6,500 tonnes more carbon associated with the Boxing Day flood that Pete mentioned at the beginning than building the whole of our flood scheme. And that's not just the 2015 commission, that's the flood scheme that was before as well. And this infographic um, we created just to sort of help contextualise that, so you can actually see what that equates to. So this is a really interesting study because it actually shows there may be a carbon benefit of building flood schemes in the short term due to the carbon avoided. And we're not suggesting at this point that that negates the need for natural flood management, more that if you then combine this with natural flood management schemes, we can future-proof this and help manage flood risk in the future. So, Mont McDonald is also really interested in, in developing this further. So, two years after the study was commissioned, we've now begun creating a tool that will be used to calculate flood damage avoided costs in the future. And we're looking to then integrate that with future OVCs to help support decision making going forward. So, hopefully, we don't just cover costs, we also cover carbon. And this is a good example of how <coughs> collaboration across teams can lead to change from future projects as well. Okay. A little bit more about the civil solution that complements the natural flood management. Uh, we need to build eight kilometres of linear defences, and we're using a range of techniques from that. So we've got concrete clad L or concrete L walls with cladding. We've got sheet piles. We've got embankments where there's space to do that. Um, we've also used hard landscaping in places such that we can create some public realm that doesn't actually look like a flood defence. We do need some active measures, so we've got some surface water pumping stations which mitigate the fact that surface water can't run into the river because we've got a wall in the way. We've got some flow control structures which protect some historic mill goits and prevent flooding from those. The walls are designed to provide 100 year standard protection which matches what we'd already built in phase one. So the second part of the solution was um, a flood storage area which will be constructed upstream of the city at Calgary. This is an area of functional floodplain. The river meanders through it. Um, it's bounded on the, the right of this image by the railway line, which is up on an embankment. Is that one? Yeah. yeah, so it's starting to rain now. You can see we've built an embankment and a, a flow control structure, which is what the concrete box is at the top. That's at the bottom end of the site. In normal flow conditions, the gates on the flow control structure are tucked away in the riverbed, and the design of that, um, that slab is permitting fish passage in both directions. The hydrograph you can see, the blue line is the incoming flow in the river, and the red line is the attenuated flow that comes out. You see now we're getting towards the peak of the event, we're getting already some storage in the floodplain. But as the flows get higher, our gates rise on hydraulic rams out to the bottom of the river, holding back up to a million cubic metres of water in the process. We've used that space to create some environmental enhancements that Hannah will come on to in a moment. The purpose of this structure is to raise the standard of protection provided by the linear defences from 1 in 100 year to the 200 year event. So we can then say to the politicians, we've met your objective of not letting Boxing Day happen again. Uh, that saved about 300 mil height on all of those walls. So there's carbon savings associated with that, as well as planning benefit and cost reduction. And as the event comes to an event, sun sets <coughs> over Keithley. Hopefully Leeds will have stayed dry. <laughs> So, right from the start of this project, Leeds were anxious to develop as many benefits as they could out of the scheme, as well as the core flood risk ones. So, these were picked up right over at the start at OBC stage. 
um, with the intention of using a large project to catalyse smaller developments that might not be affordable by other partners in the scheme. Um, there's some of them there, Hannah will cover a couple of the ecological ones in a moment. Um, picking on number 10, one of the headaches of the scheme is dealing with the multiple developers that are alongside the river. There's quite a lot of brownfield land that's in various stages of redevelopment. Um, obviously we're helping those develop <coughs> developers by providing flood protection, but as a return for that we've managed to agree an 8 metre offset for the flood walls, so we're creating a new footpath, new cycleway along the river edge. Um, which will complement those developments. So as Peter said, we didn't just want to say, well, we're doing this natural flood management scheme and we've also got these carbon benefits, so we're going to stop there. What we wanted to do is make sure that this civil scheme, we maximised all of the environmental nature-based solutions we could and also maximised any carbon reduction opportunities. So the next section of this is going to show you how we did that. So the first one, um, as you can see on the right, is actually the reservoir that was within the video. Um, so we had a really great opportunity here because we had to purchase the land um, in order to facilitate the construction works. And therefore we had some great opportunities for environmental benefits. Due to the sort of reservoir constraints, um, we held a workshop with the panel engineer, different organisations and also different members of our team so that we could agree what ideas could be implemented and where. So, for example, you can see in that top one, when this was proposed by the Environment Agency, the panel engineer said, well, that's a blockage risk. We don't want to risk that getting stuck um, in the control structure and not working. So therefore, we said, OK, what about downstream? What about here? We could agree that in the meeting without the need for back and forth emails or, say, discounting ideas that actually may be able to go ahead. <coughs> these then produced these environmental benefits that led to 19% biodiversity net gain on the site um, and also sort of helped with repairing habitat improvements, um, which helped to get signed off by the Environment Agency as the regulator as well. Where possible, we also wanted to use green solutions over great engineering ones. So, for example, here you can see a collapsed gabion wall, um, and last year we replaced that with a green wall. I uh, wanted to pull this one out, actually, because it was enabled post-planning permission um, and also proposed by one of our new technical team members. So due to the collaborative team environment we had, we were actually able to propose new solutions, even while some sections of the scheme were actively being built. So I know there's been a lot of sort of discussion on agility um, today, so I wanted to sort of mention as well how originally we didn't have the site investigation information for this, we weren't able to propose it, but once that information came through, we proposed the idea, it was designed and it was constructed all within four months. So it was sort of keeping those new ideas coming in based on new information um, throughout the whole of the project life cycle. Also worth mentioning as well that a lot of these ideas were proposed by specialists working on the ground, some maybe within the first couple of years working at Mott McDonald. So by having that sort of dialogue between them and also the decision makers in the site office enabled a lot of these things to be taken forward when maybe they couldn't if there was more of a separation. Where we couldn't adopt green solutions, we tried to enhance existing infrastructure. And one example of this is with floating riverbanks. So, as you can see uh, in the right-hand picture, that's actually taken from a different project because we're not going to be installing these until the summer. Um, but the left-hand picture is where it's planning to go. So the idea is that they hook onto the top of the sheep hard wall and are then anchored to the bottom and they rise and fall with the river levels. So uh, particularly along the railway line, there are some areas where the site is quite constrained, so we couldn't necessarily set back a wall or keep that natural river. So where we've done that, We've then aimed to sort of do these green solutions on top of the grey ones to sort of keep improving the biodiversity. Um, and these are also <coughs> carbon negative as well. Um, so they take in more carbon over their lifetime than they do to put on, to create, sorry. So moving on then to this last area <coughs> we wanted to touch upon, and that's the carbon approach we adopted on this scheme. So as already discussed, all project partners agreed it was really important to reduce carbon within the body design and construction as much as possible. We didn't want to become complacent with a natural flood management scheme and the fact that we had this University of Edinburgh study wanted to continue to improve the numbers we already had. Therefore, the first thing we did is a carbon baseline assessment for the scheme that was awarded planning permission. So this works out what the carbon emissions were in the design we already had. The aim was then to update this baseline using a bill of quantities after each area is constructed to work out the savings. 
To create a focus point, we held a carbon target workshop to ensure we had goals to work towards. We did this as a bottom-up exercise, which means we worked out what savings we may be able to make before then agreeing and publicising the targets. This made the targets achievable, yet also ambitious. So in this slide, you can just see an example here of how we pulled up different materials within the workshop to show that what the changes in carbon emissions would be based on the material changes. So for example, here you can see what the differences are between regular sheet piles and eco sheet piles. This could then be agreed within the forum, because we had the decision makers in there, as well as the carbon specialists, to then say, OK, we think we can take this forward. Um, and then we were able to do this with multiple different materials to then get to a number that we would be able to hit if we did all of these interventions, and we could then set our targets from there. We thought this, again, was a very uh, good way of doing it, just to help uh, sort of everyone in the room visually see um, what difference some of these choices could make. So we didn't stop there. Um, as well as this, we then ran a series of carbon workshops to identify further opportunities to reduce our carbon impact. Um, and again, these have multiple teams and organisations within them. We mapped the ideas out in a graph so that we could prioritise the ones with the highest impact and highest feasibility first, and then work through the others as well. And just this one is just a few of the ideas that we then took forward. We didn't just have one of these workshops, we had multiple workshops throughout the project life cycle because as already uh, sort of said, which is right, that the greatest scope for change is at the beginning, but we also felt that there may be change like later on in the process, so we were keen to make sure we kept running these throughout. So we've talked a lot about the actual project team, um, which were really important in helping with this, but we also had really strong top-down leadership when it came to reducing carbon within the embodied design and construction. As Pete said, a project board had been set up, which has an agenda item for carbon on every meeting. They authorise new carbon ideas, such as the use of HBO fuel for construction plant, and the use of burrow pits rather than using new material, um, even if they may say have a more increased cost associated with them. Um, we've only done one zone so far, um, so we've still got a little way to go. We're kind of hoping to get construction finished in the next 18 months, but it's showing a 34% reduction in the first zone um, relative to our baseline. Just to sum up and a few learning points that we've taken away from this project, none of these are unique I'm sure but things have come really well together and I think a part of that is having Leeds as an agile client who are not averse to bending process and making things happen if they, they want to. So we mentioned collaboration, that's been there right from the beginning and we've used that to catalyse benefits that were would otherwise not be achieved. Uh, strong top-down leadership from the project board. We've established really good discipline of actually presenting evidence to those meetings on a monthly basis, and that then gives us really clear decisions and allows us to move forward quickly. Um, we've had a few conversations at lunchtime about how the carbon agenda needs to be driven by, or is being driven by, the youngest members of the team. So um, <coughs> we've had a project office for most of the duration of this project, obviously COVID disrupted that, but uh, we've all sat together for different organisations, try and bring in as many people as we can into that office, um, encourage ideas to be shared. And then collaborative planning has been really important. Um, because of the fast pace of this project, we've got zones that are back at discharge of planning conditions process. Some are in detailed design, some are already out on site in construction. So the opportunity to trip up and miss a permit or miss something that needs us to keep us going is, is very real and getting the right experts in the room to sequence operations correctly has been really beneficial. So I hope that's been of interest in a case study with ideas that can move into other big infrastructure projects. That's certainly one that we're both proud to have worked on um, and I think take comfort with the fact that we can prove that building this scheme, although it does have a big carbon <coughs> impact and we're trying to mitigate that, um, it's actually less than what would happen if the same event happened again in the future. And given climate change, that's likely to be more than once over <coughs> the next 100 years. Thank you very much. Thank you.